this in, you know. Uh, I think uh, I, you'd have to help me. It, it didn't, isn't the last one, in other words, it is dying to self and self attitudes. Was that about the end? I don't no? Maybe. Maybe. I don't uh, yeah, because I had the bent C, you remember the bent, the C is the bent I, and da da da, and, seek, and it ends, and seeks its own glory, at last bows its head to God's will, admits its wrong, gives up its own way to Jesus, surrenders its right and discards its own glory, that the Lord Jesus might have all and be all. In other words, it is dying to self and self-attitudes. So I think we got that, and he's a little further. And as we look honestly at our Christian lives, we can see how much of this self there is in each of us. It is so often self who tries to live the Christian life. The mere fact that we use the word try indicates that it is self who has the responsibility. And it came home to me again, you know, how self-centered our attitude is to living the Christian life. And I don't mean just self-centered in that word, doing obviously selfish things. I mean how much we see things from our angle, you know. How much, how deeply, and I ask you to ask the Holy Spirit to show you this, how deeply, deep down in our subconscious, we are all the time looking out from our angle, you know all the time th thinking of the, the holiest and most spiritual insights. Still, it's from our angle, you know. We're in charge. I, I used to wonder why Bart went to such trouble to emphasize, you know, that it cannot be looking at God from man's angle. You won't see God then that way. You only see God through his own eyes. And I used to think, what complicated tautology are you involved in here? And more and more I can see it, you know. We look at everything from our angle, you know. We're thinking all the time, in a deep way, we're thinking all the time from our angle. How much of self there is in each of us. It is so often self who tries to live the Christian life. The mere fact that we use the word try indicates that it is self who is the responsibility. It is self too who is often doing Christian work. I'm horrified how much driving mirror stuff I do. And I think I'm pretty shrewd about it. Driving mirror, looking in the driving mirror to see behind you, to see what you've done, you know. How much, how much, oh, well, I did that quite well. Or did I do that quite well? Which is just as much preoccupation with self as I did this well, you know. So how often we're looking at things from our angle so that we may laugh a bit at the Buddhist uh, and the other guys, but sometimes they're escaping into the numinous more than we are. The numinous, you know, where you lose yourself in what is real. And often we're more preoccupied with ourselves and our own experience than those guys that we think are specialized in it. It is self too who is often doing Christian work. It is always self who gets irritable and envious and resentful and critical and worried. It is always self who gets irritable and envious and resentful and critical and worried. Always, you know. It is self who is hard and unyielding in its attitudes to others. It is self who is hard and unyielding in its attitude to others. It is self who is shy and self-conscious and reserved. Oh no, I'm just being humble. It is self who is shy and self-conscious and reserved. 
No wonder we need breaking. As long as self is in control, God can do little with us. For all the fruits of the Spirit, in Galatians 5, with which God longs to fill us, are the complete antithesis of the hard, unbroken spirit within us and presupposes that it has been crucified. The fruits of the Spirit, you know, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. All the complete antithesis of the hard, unbroken spirit within us. Being broken is both God's work and ours. He brings his pressure to bear, but we have to make the choice. He brings his pressure to bear but we have to make the choice. If we are really open to conviction as we seek fellowship with God, and willingness for the light is the prime condition of fellowship with God, if we do that, God will show us the expressions of this proud, hard self that cause him pain. Then it is we can stiffen our necks, and refuse to repent. Or we can bow the head and say, Yes, Lord. Brokenness in daily experience is simply the response of humility to the conviction of God. And inasmuch as this conviction is continuous, we shall need to be broken continually. Sometimes, you know, we, we think, oh yes, it's just, oh, good, I see it, I see it. Okay, I see it. Yeah, but it's not seeing it that you need. It's it being broken within you. And of course, that's where he is so much wiser than we are. We think, oh, we see it, so now we can fix it. He knows, no. You have to allow it to be broken within you by again and again and again. How often have you said that? I've been here before. Why? How often do I have to learn this? Well, because you're only learning it. You're not allowing the self inside to be broken. And this can be very costly when we see all the yielding of rights and selfish interests that this will involve, and the confessions and restitutions that may become sometimes necessary. For this reason, we are not likely to be broken except at the cross of Jesus. The willingness of Jesus to be broken for us is the all-compelling motive in our being broken too. So Lord Jesus, were you broken were you humbled, and I am in you. Am I willing to be humbled too? We see him who is in the form of God, counting not equality with God a prize to be grasped or hung unto, but letting it go for us and taking upon him the form of a servant, God's servant, man's servant. Sometimes you know it happens and you think, but I don't deserve that. I don't deserve to be treated like this. Well, probably you do, but uh, no big deal. It, did he deserve to be treated like that? We see him willing to have no rights of his own, no home of his own, no possessions of his own, willing to let men revile him and not revile again, willing to let men tread on him and not retaliate or defend himself. That's what spoils the conversation so often, isn't it? We want to kind of get our dig in or get our clever insight expressed. And if you just kept quiet, there'd be a soft gentleness would develop between you and the other person. 
but you don't give the soft gentleness a chance because you're so busy making the point. Above all, we see him broken as he meekly goes to Calvary to become man's scapegoat by burying their sins in his own body on the tree. This, of course, this, this next one is a hard one. Every man has great difficulty with this one. I suppose the woman has also. Here it is. In a pathetic passage, in a prophetic psalm. He says, I am a worm and no man. Well, you know, we guys were taught, of course, never, never to be at that position. I am a worm and no man. How stupid could he be? What a thing to say. What a lack of courage. What a lack of dignity, you know. I am a worm and no man. Those who have been in tropical lands tell us that there is a big difference between a snake and a worm when you attempt to strike at them. The snake rears itself up and hisses and tries to strike back. The snake rears itself up and hisses and tries to strike back. A true picture of self. But a worm offers no resistance. It allows you to do what you like with it. Kick it or squash it under your heel. A picture of true brokenness. Always. Always. I don't know about the other man here, but always as a man, I was certainly encouraged not to do that. But of course, if you did that, they'd walk over the top of you. You had to give them what for. And Jesus was willing to become just that for us, a worm and no man. Didn't call the bands of angels, you know. He could have destroyed the planet at that moment. And he did so because that is what he saw us to be. Worms, having forfeited all rights by our sin, except to deserve hell. And he now called us to take our rightful place as worms for him and with him. Do you think God will stand up for you if you do that? Well, have you any doubt of it? Have you any doubt of it? The whole Sermon on the Mount with its teaching of non-retaliation, love for enemies and selfless giving assumes that that is the position. That is our position. But only the vision of the love that was willing to be broken for us can constrain us to be willing for that. Lord, bend that proud and stiff-necked eye. Help me to bow the head and die. Beholding him on Calvary, who bowed his head for me. But dying to self is not a thing we do once for all. There may be an initial dying for when God first chose these things, but ever after it will be a, a constant dying. For only so can the Lord Jesus be revealed constantly through us. All day long the choice will be before us in a thousand ways. It will mean no plans, no time, no money, no pleasure of our own. It will mean a constant yielding to those around us. For our yieldedness to God 
is measured by our yieldedness to man. Every humiliation, everyone who tries and vexes us, is God's way of breaking us so that there is a yet deeper channel in us for the life of Christ. You see, the only life that pleases God and that can be victorious is his life, never our life, no matter how hard we try. But inasmuch as our self-centered life is the exact opposite of his, we can never be filled with his life unless we are prepared for God to bring out life constantly, bring our life constantly to death. And in that we must cooperate by our moral choice. But I can see, you know, and you can see yourself. It's the only way to live together in peace. And if you live that way in peace, there we become aware of a, a, another person who seems to walk the floors of these rooms. And we become aware of a sweetness in the atmosphere. And uh, a healing power that uh, brings us relaxation and rest every time we come through the doors. And enables us to be strengthened each time we go out. To the world. And uh, it comes because there's blowing around the atmosphere a spirit uh, of Christ that softens everything and uh, makes us more like Him. So I think God has called us to something uh, beautiful and good and something that is the opposite of the spirit of the world, you know. So, let us pray. <clears throat>